Hi, I'm Anna Marie. I uh, work at A-List Education as our Director of Advising, and I am very pleased to introduce uh, Emily Rutherford. She works as an admission counselor at Colgate, and I know a lot of you have students who um, probably have mostly parents here today, but you might have students who are going to apply to Colgate. So hopefully this will give you some insights that will help um, as you're deciding what types of schools are going to be a match for your student, and also if particularly Colgate is what it is you can be doing to really enhance your application as you're finishing up your last couple of years of high school. So I'm going to pass this over to Emily and then at the end um, we'll probably chat for 20 or 30 minutes and at the end do some Q&A. So um, if you have any questions feel free to save them till the end and then we can take a moment to go over that. So I will pass this on right now to Emily. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you so much Anna Marie. Can, can everyone hear me? Think so? Yeah, uh, yeah, right. awesome. Think, yeah. Gosh, awesome, just wanted to check and make sure. Um, so thank you so much for having me here today. I really appreciate the chance to speak a little bit about Colgate and um, tell everyone a little bit about sort of what our school is about and tell you a little bit about what we're looking for in applicants and um, sort of how our community works and all of those wonderful things. So just to start off with, uh, we are a small liberal arts institution located in, in central New York, upstate New York. So definitely quite a small town called Hamilton that we're located in, no relation to the musical that I'm aware of. Um, and it is a really lovely small community of about 4,000 people. And our school is similarly small as well. So we're about 2,900 students. Um, so I think that kind of puts us on sort of the larger side of the really small schools and then definitely on the smaller side of the medium schools. And what that allows us to do is offer our students a bunch of different university level opportunities such as the 54 different majors and 10 unique academic minors that we are able to offer our students but at the same time our average class size is 18 and about 70 percent of our courses are under 20 students so you're definitely getting this very small classroom discussion based um, kind of learning going on here at Colgate. Something that's a little bit different about Colgate um, among that sort of small school cohort is that we do have Division I athletics on our campus. So we have 25 varsity sports teams that compete at that Division I level within the Patriot League. So that's something that um, kind of sets us apart in some ways from our peer institution since we do have that sort of big sports culture that you can participate in if you would like to on our campus. And that mentality of excellence and of challenging yourself and really um, performing at that high level that comes with being a Division I athletic school is something that really um, kind of goes through everything that Colgate students do on our campus. So we have over 200 student clubs and organizations that you could join as a student here. Um, and there's all kinds of different ways that you can get involved at Colgate. For example, probably our most popular set of clubs and organizations is the COPE, which is our Center for Outreach, Volunteerism, and, and Education on campus. So essentially our community service organization at Colgate. And that has about 40 clubs that are associated with it. And last year our students did about 32,000 hours of community service as a group, which given that there's so few of them, I think is a pretty impressive number. We also um, have a debate team on campus that is ranked third in the US and 11th internationally. So definitely um, some high level debate going on here at Colgate. And then finally, our orchestra director, Marietta Chang, likes to say that if there were such a thing as Division I orchestra, the Colgate Orchestra would be it. So all sorts of different things that you can get involved in on our campus, all sorts of different ways that you can engage with um, all with each other, with the faculty outside of the classroom. About 80% of our faculty live in or around the town of Hamilton. So they're largely community members when they're here. And that's something that's really important to us as a liberal arts institution to continue to offer our students opportunities not just to um, interact with our faculty in those small classroom spaces, but also to be community members alongside them. You'll often hear about faculty members hosting office hours at the coffee shops downtown or even inviting their students over to dinner at their own homes and really giving them these opportunities to see them not just as mentors within the classroom, but also as mentors outside of it and really um, kind of making sure that those relationships are reinforced. So that's something that we find to be very, very important here as a largely residential community, especially given that about 92% of our students live on campus and the 8% that live off campus are seniors that are all living just down the road downtown about a 10 minute walk away from campus. So we really are a community based um, kind of 
college. And we're, we're a very small institution that really puts a premium on making sure that you have this sort of small campus atmosphere, but at the same time, all these big opportunities going on. Um, so that's sort of a little bit about how our community works. Shifting gears into academics a little bit, we have a core curriculum at Colgate, and that's how we kind of structure this liberal arts mindset that we, um, that we teach within. And so this core curriculum that we have, it's four courses. They need to be completed by the end of your sophomore year as a student here. So generally students will take one class for each of their first four semesters. However, you're welcome to double up, triple up, quadruple up. And really, it really depends on what you'd like to do. You can take them in any order that, you're, that you'd like them to, as long as they're done by the end of your second year at Colgate. And the reason why we ask you to do that is because these courses are going to give you the foundational skill set that you need in order to be academically successful at Colgate, but also to have this sort of flexible toolkit of problem solving mechanisms that you can use not only for your upperclassmen coursework, but in any given career that you choose to go into after Colgate. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we teach our students through this core curriculum, and it's it's been around since about 1928, but our faculty actually go on a retreat every single year, and they kind of discuss and debate and figure out, is this the best way to continue educating Colgate students in the modern age, and is this the best way of delivering that information? These are all small seminar style courses, they're all capped at 18 students, so you know you're going to be getting this really um, kind of small environment. You know, people are going to notice if you don't show up to class. Faculty members are going to challenge you to make sure that you're interacting and that you're participating and that you're learning how to do research on the college level and that you're learning how to write a college level and not just a college level really but a Colgate level paper while you're in these courses. Then after the end of your sophomore year you you're welcome to declare your major whenever you'd like to, but most students declare, uh, well, you are required to declare, to declare, excuse me, by the end of your sophomore year. So you have those first two years to sort of explore the core curriculum, explore um, things that you might be potentially interested in majoring in, different departments that kind of appeal to you, and then really the uh, second two years of your Colgate experience is mostly uh, uh, excuse me, focused upon your major and or your minor coursework. So about 25% of Colgate students tend to double major and about 40% engage in both a major and a minor. So definitely our students are interested in all kinds of different things across those 54 different academic disciplines that I mentioned earlier. Um, from the social sciences to the humanities to the natural sciences, some of our most popular majors include economics, biology, um, English I believe is up there as well. Neuroscience is something that's growing. So they're all across the sort of each given division um, that we have on our campus. And, you know, even if you're in the most popular department on our campus, which I think would be economics, they're all still going to be really, really small given that we are such a small institution. So you're going to have these opportunities to be engaging with your faculty members and with your professors in this sort of smaller space, regardless of whether you're a natural sciences student, mathematics student, humanities student, regardless of what you're studying. So lots of different ways that you can explore um, through our different academic curricular options. Um, another way that our students sort of tend to academically explore at Colgate outside of the classroom is through research. So we have about 200 students that stay on campus every single year during the summer and pursue full-time research at Colgate um, during that sort of off season. And last year we allocated about three quarters of a million dollars worth of funding for these students. We have again about 2,900 students at Colgate and only eight of them are graduate students. So you have these really this Kind of high-powered faculty we have about our student faculty ratio is nine to one so we have about 300 faculty members on our campus that are all doing this cutting-edge scholarship as part of their professorships but when they're looking to students to really help them with their work they're looking to our undergraduate students first and foremost we have a, a biology professor on our campus professor hagos that likes to say that he can teach people how to um, how to pipette and how to use lab equipment and perform under the scientific method, but he can't teach students to be passionate about zebrafish, which is what he does a lot of his research with. So when they're looking to recruit students for these projects, they're really looking for students who are excited about the material and who want to be there and who want to learn and see this as 
really an extension of the classroom environment. So as a student at Colgate, you can come up with your own research project, create a proposal for the university and get your own funding to do research either on campus or off. You can even get a grant sometimes to travel as well. Uh, or you can be recruited to a faculty members project too. And our students are often not only first off authors on papers, but presenting at national research conferences. So lots of different opportunities for you, regardless of whether you're in the sciences, social sciences, humanities. We actually have an art and art history professor on our campus who does research into the history of the art and architecture at Colgate in honor of our bicentennial that's upcoming in 2019. And he has about 30 students working with him in the archives at Colgate. And he's an art and art history professor. He's actually also the mayor of the town of Hamilton. Um, so there's a lot going on on our campus. A lot of people are involved in many different facets of the community. And um, research is a really great way to get involved regardless of what you're interested in. Uh, we do have a certain program that I always like to highlight that actually we're the only undergraduate institution in the entire world that has a relationship with the National Institutes of Health, where essentially you can study abroad at the NIH for um, a semester as a student here at Colgate and generally this is um, students in their senior fall so these students will go it's generally capped at about 18 students or so and you'll go to this to the NIH for a full semester and do 30 hours of research per week there and then take seminar style courses at night with Colgate faculty to complement your research work so this is great for students who are interested in maybe going to medical school pursuing biomedical research pursuing research in the sciences moving on to a PhD program maybe um, can be a really great way of getting some practical experience at the National Institutes of Health uh, which is really wonderful and they love Colgate students. Sometimes students will even actually go down earlier in the summer and spend up to six months there doing research. Um, so it can be a really wonderful opportunity for our students. So speaking of study abroad, definitely a very, very popular option at Colgate. We have about 67% of our students that study off campus. And we call it off campus study because um, we offer some domestic options as well. So 23 different Colgate faculty led what we call study groups where um, it's only Colgate students, only Colgate faculty, small groups, again, under 20 students that travel to these different locations around the US and also internationally as well, studying various different things. Um, so programs range from language-based programs in China or Europe or South America sometimes even. Uh, we also have a program that goes to Australia that studies any discipline in the natural sciences. So that one's quite flexible. You could be a neuroscience student, a computer science student, a physics student going on this program and still go abroad and get to go actually to the University of Wollongong in Australia. Um, so all kinds of different things. Students who are athletes study abroad, students who are pre-med study abroad. You know, it, it really is very flexible here at Colgate and our, um, our advisors on campus are very willing to work with you and make sure you're able to get that experience if you'd like to. So those are the Colgate faculty-led programs. And then in addition to that, we have over 100 pre-approved programs that go to over 50 different countries. So there's a lot of different options that you can choose from. And pre-approved means that you know it's going to work out. You know how the credits work. You know how the housing works. Colgate has said, you know, this program is up to our level of academic rigor and takes care of its students. And that can be a great option for students who maybe want to get outside that Colgate classroom and meet students from other schools and try something out that's different for a little bit, for a little while before they return to campus and return to that Colgate classroom. So again, you can go to over 50 different countries through, through those pre-approved programs. So lots happening in terms of those semester long options. And then in addition to that, we do have an option called an extended study where you stay on campus for a normal semester, taking classes as though you normally would, and then one of your usually about four classes is our average course load so one of your four courses would be with a faculty member who takes the class to travel at the end of the class period on um, at the end of the semester so you would go for about maybe between a week and a half and three weeks to a location that's relevant to what you were learning about in the course so students will really take advantage of this as an additional travel opportunity for example if you're a first year student or if you'd like to get off campus in your senior year if you would like to um, kind of spend some additional time off campus, or if you just don't want to leave in the middle of a semester, it can be a great way of getting that kind of global experience into your education, um, regardless of what your commitments on campus are. And we offer portable financial aid as well for our off-campus study, um, which means that for up to one semester long program and one of those shorter extended study options that I just mentioned, we will um, 
we will give you financial aid as well and it can travel with you to those locations. It's also incremental aid, which means that should that be um, a more expensive um, opportunity. So for example, if you're living somewhere more expensive than Hamilton, New York, which is most places to be completely honest, um, then that will be taken into account by the financial aid office when they're really calculating your package for that time period. So that's something that we're pretty proud of because we want you to be able to say yes to all these different opportunities that we have on campus and make sure that our students have access to them. Um, so there is that option that we have for our students. A few other programs that I always like to highlight include um, our Global Leaders Lecture Series. So that brings in all kinds of different speakers that are 21st century newsmakers, which is a very broad definition. It's essentially anyone who's sort of generating noteworthy work or news in the 21st century. So previous speakers have included, both of the Clintons have been speakers. Uh, we also had um, last spring Aretha Franklin come in and she was a speaker and she came and sang and spoke to our students. Uh, the Dalai Lama has been here previously. Up, up and coming, we actually have Joe Biden coming next week, um, which our whole community is very excited about. And I think tickets sold out for that and they were completely free, but they sold out within minutes. Um, so definitely lots going on um, in terms of who we're bringing to campus. And there are also opportunities for our students to participate in panel discussions with these speakers who come in. So they'll come in, they'll give a big lecture to the whole community, but you can also apply to be a part of these organizations that will come in and um, and interact closely with the um, speakers that come in. So I know a student actually who I was talking to today who um, was able to have sort of this smaller discussion based experience with Whoopi Goldberg. And he actually has her personal email and has been emailing with her for a couple of years. <laughs> so lots going on here in the very small town of Hamilton, New York. Um, and these people come in really with the intention of connecting with Colgate students. So that's a really wonderful opportunity that we're able to offer our students on campus here. Another program that I'd like to highlight is our Thought Into Action Entrepreneurship Program, which is a really great option for students who are entrepreneurially minded or interested in business. So this is a program it's extracurricular it's not a part of our academic programming but it's a program that you can apply into with either a business idea or um, sort of a set of skills or just a really interest in business and you're able to be if you're accepted you're able to be paired up with a Colgate mentor who's either an alumnus or who is a parent of a current student who has business expertise in the area of the of what your idea is and you and your team will take that idea from just an idea all the way up through a viable business plan including marketing legal everything that you need to actually run a business and so then at the end of the year after this person has mentored you for a full for a full um, school year you actually compete with other student groups for funding in basically a live version of Shark Tank that we have on our campus, which is a lot of fun for students who are entrepreneurs, but is also a lot of fun for students who are friends with those students on our campus, because you get to see your friends on a live version of Shark Tank. And we'll fly in all these different sharks to judge the competition and tell the student and actually really award real funding to students. So for example, past panelists that we've had include the CEO of Warby Parker, the CEO of Chegg, Jessica Alba, who's the owner and CEO of The Honest Company, and then also MC Hammer. So all kinds of different people coming in um, and they can fund students up to $10,000. So there's a lot going on in terms of entrepreneurship on our campus um, and really in general I think we do a great job of balancing this kind of classic small liberal arts campus based um, experience that you're able to have as a student here while also really valuing practical experience and making sure that students are able to connect with all these different opportunities that will give them sort of those hard skill sets that they need out in the working world. Um, so to that end, we really tap into our alumni base for that. Like I mentioned with those alumni mentors for the Thought Into Action program, we have about 33,000 living alums. And to say that they're passionate about the Colgate experience is putting it a little bit lightly. They're extremely, extremely excited about Colgate and want to make sure that current students and recent graduates are really able to connect with all kinds of different opportunities um, out, outside of campus and in the working world. So some of our top fields that graduates go into include the health professions as well as finance and economics or excuse me, finance and banking, um, real estate, you know, it, it's kind of all over the map communications. So all sorts of different industries that Colgate, um, that Colgate graduates are not only 
employed in but successful in and there are these great opportunities and resources for our students we have some programming that's specifically geared towards our first and second year students through our center for career services on campus to really start getting you thinking about these things early and not getting you necessarily on a track or making final decisions about what you'd like to do but get you thinking about what what would i maybe like to do and how is it best for me to engage with these different career opportunities so one of these programs is called day in the life where over winter break is a first or second year student. You can be paired up with an alum in a field that you're interested in potentially working in after you graduate. And there's someone who's located geographically near to where you'll be over that winter break. And you can go and shadow them for a full day of work and see the inside of wherever they're working and kind of try it on for size for a day and figure out, you know, is this something that I'm interested in? And students tend to walk out of this program with one of two different reactions, which is either this is amazing, I loved it, I'd love to continue pursuing opportunities in this realm or you know maybe this isn't for me this I'd be happy to never see the inside of another operating room slash you know investment bank slash real estate office wherever you were on that day again and that's completely fine because when you're 19 or 20 years old that can be really really useful data for you to know that that's not something that you're interested in doing um, so that's a great program for students in their first and second year to start sort of thinking through those options we also have a program called uh, sophomore connections where students are invited back early for their second semester of their sophomore year about a weekend early and we have about 125 alums come back to our campus every single year and they run panels and workshops and they network with our students and they help them start figuring out you know how do I build a career network and how do I go about applying for things how has Colgate specifically helped them in the past too um, and so it's a great opportunity to get together with alums hear their stories start actually forming your own network as well as early as your second year of college so that's a really valuable time period for our students to sort of start thinking about those different connections. We have 125 different campus or recruiters who come onto our campus specifically to hire our students a little bit for internships, but mostly for part-time jobs um, in, through that recruitment process. And that's ranging from everything from tech to um, fields like executive search, finance, you know, it's, it's all across the map. Um, and it's, it's a really great way of making sure that our students are supported, but also those recruiters are coming to campus because they want to hire Colgate students, they want Colgate students at their companies. So definitely um, a great launch pad out into whatever you'd like to do. Um, our, about 97% of our students report that as of about six to nine percent, or six to nine months after graduation, they are either full-time employed, full-time pursuing graduate school, involved in a fellowship such as Teach for America or the Peace Corps, or they're um, doing some sort of essentially full-time volunteer work. So about 97% of folks are landing exactly where they'd like to land after the end of Colgate. Um, and that's something that we're really, really proud of here. Um, just quickly in terms of admission and financial aid, we accept both the common and the coalition application here at Colgate. So no preference given to either one, you're welcome to apply using either mechanism. We have an early decision both one and two process, early decision one being due on November 15th of every year, early decision two being due on the same date as our regular um, admission deadline, which is January 15th, um, early decision being that binding um, agreement. So if you, you agree that if you're accepted to Colgate early decision, you'll matriculate and withdraw all of your other college applications. Um, early decision one and two are both binding. That early decision two is again on a little bit of a later timeline and it is a rolling process from our side. So after you submit that application, we'll get back to you within about four to six weeks with an admission decision. So so anytime between that November 15th deadline and actually March 1st because you are able to convert your regular decision application from regular decision to early decision two, if you would like as well. So you have a little bit of extra time. You have made that extra commitment to Colgate. It's a great option if Colgate is your top choice. Um, but again, I will remind you it is binding. So that's sort of how timeline works in terms of applications. So what are we looking at as admission officers when we're looking at your application? I like to say there's six different things that we look at, which is kind of like a whole hand plus one, always kind of annoys me, but six things um, that we're looking at with your application. So again, either the coalition or common application is completely fine. And the first thing that we look at is your high school transcript, because that is sort of the heart and soul of your academic, um, your academic character and who you've been as a student. Because it's not just one test that you've taken, it's all the different choices that you've made over the course of four years and how you've performed when you've made those choices. Um, so generally we're looking at both 
you know, what kind of classes has the student taken and how have they done in those classes, but also what's available at your high school, because we know not every school offers the same things, not every school has the same level of resources. So some schools have a ton of classes and you can take however many you want. Some have a ton of classes, but they put a limit on it. Some have, you know, um, some aren't even able to have their students take more than three or four classes at a time. We know that your high school is probably different from every other high school in America. So we receive information about how your school works. We're also responsible for um, certain geographic areas as admission counselors in our office. So for me personally, I'm responsible for traveling to and reading applications from all of Connecticut schools except for Fairfield County schools, all of California excepting San Francisco and Los Angeles since that's what our um, Dean Gary Ross covers in California, and then also internationally I recruit in Europe as well. So there's a lot of different places that we're responsible for keeping track of, and that's our job is to sort of know where you're coming from. So that's sort of my long-winded way of talking about your transcript and where you come from. Some other things that we look at include testing. So we do require um, we do require testing. Either the SAT or the ACT is fine. We don't look at the essay or the writing section of either test. Um, so if that's an area of concern for you, don't worry about it. We don't look at it. Uh, we do accept secondary testing such as the SATs or the AP or AP course or excuse me SAT twos. APs, IBs, if you want to send them on to us, if you have them, that's completely fine. They are not a requirement for admission. Um, so definitely, you know, I would encourage you if you're, if you feel like it'll really help your application to submit it if you'd like to, um, but not, again, not a requirement in any way, shape, or form. We do also take um, recommendations from two teachers and one guidance counselor um, or college counselor, whatever the case may be at your high school. Um, and that is a great way for us to tell who are you as a student in your community and maybe how would you be as a Colgate student? How would you contribute to our community on campus? Um, so we have that aspect of it. We also look at students' activities. So do you or does your child come home at the end of the school day and shut the door and stare at a wall all evening? Probably not, right? So they're probably, maybe have a part-time job or are involved in clubs or sports. Maybe there's a relative that's sick that they need to help out with. You know, there's there's something going on in their lives outside of what they're doing in the classroom and we want to know what, what those things are. Um, so there's that piece of it. We also look at your personal statement. So 500 words on either the Common or Coalition application. Um, and that's your chance to talk to us in your own voice and get to say what you'd like to say. And definitely I'd recommend there putting something in that even if you're talking about something that comes through in your application and other places. So say you love to play sports and it's all over your application that you love sports and you want to write your essay about sports, that's completely fine. But try and bring a new perspective to it that we couldn't have gotten from anywhere else in your application. Um, so that's sort of my advice there about your application essay. So then we also ask students to complete a Colgate specific essay prompt as well. So that's 250 words. There's four choices, or at least there were four choices this past year. Uh, they do change every year. So can't unfortunately let you know what those are going to be moving forward because we don't know yet. Um, so there's that piece of it as well. And that's the final piece of your application. So we're, we have a holistic reading process here at Colgate. We do read every piece of every application that comes to us. So you know we're looking at every given thing. We don't have any sort of score cutoffs or anything like that, um, but we do expect a high academic profile from our students, um, but we know everyone's school is different, everyone is different as well, so um, that's sort of how that admission piece works. Then turning to financial aid, we expect students who are submitting um, domestic applications, so domestic students or dual citizens, to submit the FAFSA and the CSS profile. If you are um, a DACA or an international student, just the CSS profile will do. Um, and then we'll look at that information. We, ex we expect you to submit it along the same timelines as your uh, application deadlines because we want to be able to give you that same um, information about your financial aid package at the time of your acceptance. So our average, um, our average, excuse me, our, oh wait, I forgot to say, we, we, um, we meet 100% of demonstrated need at Colgate. So that's something that we're, again, really proud of. Um, and that means that if you need X amount of money and that's the, to make up the difference between what you can afford to pay and what Colgate's tuition is, um, then we will give you that amount of money in your financial aid package. Um, and again, that's something that we're quite proud of as an institution. So there's that piece of it. And then in terms of just sort of averages and numbers and things like that, our average debt load for an aided student after four years upon graduation, so all four years altogether, it's about $16,000, so about $4,000 a year. Um, and that's less than half the national average. So again, that's something that we're, that we're quite proud of at Colgate. Um, so I think that's pretty much all I had um, in terms of 
kind of the main body of what I'd like to talk about. Um, just quickly, I'd love to, if my screen sharing works, I'd love to show you some, um, some pictures of what it looks like uh, at Colgate, um, if it will work, we'll see. So here's what it looks like coming into our campus. We are located on quite a large hill. Those are some students jogging. Um, so this is the admission office that we have here. Um, this is our science center on campus, our cultural center. This is our student center. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of um, sort of what, our, what we look like, especially on a beautiful summer's day. Um, all right, so I think that's pretty much all I had for you today. I don't know if I want to, if Anna Marie, you want to take it away, but um, thanks so much for listening and I look sure. forward to hearing your questions. Yeah, so I'll jump in with the first question, but um, if anyone has questions along the way, feel free to speak up. You can just unmute yourself if you do have a question and um, the, the Zoom program will let you have the lead. So for starters, I'm as a lot of our students are taking SAT and ACT, how do you view the essay portion of that? Great question. So we actually don't evaluate the essay portion of that um, of the test. So we really see your supplemental essay and your personal statement essay as being the writing samples that we need in order to evaluate your level of preparedness to write at a college level. Great. Okay. And for the supplemental essays, I feel like a lot of our students aren't sure how much it actually matters because they seem short. Could you mm -hmm. talk about how you read it and how it can weigh in an application if you have lots of applications that are really similar? Great question. So it's, it's just another piece of data that we're using, right? And it's another chance for you to talk to us beyond all those different figures and facts and, you know, bullet points of what do I do in the classroom and outside of it that's already available in your application. So I think it's always good to, to keep in mind, not just for Colgate, but for any school with a supplemental essay, um, three things. So firstly, you know, why am I applying to this school? because it can really come through in your application and um, in terms of, you know, what, what, what's your motivation for being here? So definitely doing your research, making sure that it's coming through, that you understand the institution can be, can be pretty important there. Um, also, you know, what would you bring to the school? What would you bring to the community? Because we're using this to see, um, you know, how would you interact with other students on our campus? We are a residentially based community. You know, again, we have about 92% of our students living on campus and the 8% that don't live right off campus and are walking to campus all the time so we're looking for students who are community minded specifically at Colgate so making sure that we can understand how would you kind of fit into that community and what how would you impact it in any significant way is important for us and those questions are designed to kind of provoke those responses from students um, so they're they're not there to trick you or anything like that we're not looking for any one thing in particular we're really just looking for you to be yourself and then the last piece of advice that I'll give about again this is not just Colgate specific advice, this is general advice. Um, I would say in any given situation where you're submitting writing to a college, please, please proofread and make sure that you've said the name of the correct college. Um, since we as admission officers see that more, more than we would like to, um, how excited a student is to attend an institution that is not our institution. And when we see it in a recommendation or something, you know, we take it with a grain of salt. We know it's not the student who submitted that, but when, as far as you have control over it as a student, I would recommend that you proofread as carefully as you can. <laughs> Definitely, good advice. Um, when do you guys actually release those prompts? Do you release them in the summer or when the Common App opens? Or? I'm not sure if it's exactly when the Common App opens, but it, it is over the summer, so it, it should be. Um, it won't be for quite a few months now for us. I believe Common App usually goes live around August 1st, and I would assume it would be around that same time frame so that students who've um, started preparing can get that application submitted when they'd like to. Great. Um, and do you guys track demonstrated interest? Do you pay attention to people who visit campus or don't visit campus? Great question. So we, we know that we're located in quite a rural area. So we actually, we don't track demonstrated interest uh, since we know that, you know, not everyone can get to our campus, but definitely if you're able to visit, it's always great to do that because you can get a sense of um, what the campus is like. 
get a feel for it, get a feel for who the students are, see them walking around, um, or if you're there over a break, interact with uh, your tour guide or someone who's on campus at that given time. Um, so interviews, you can request them. They're based off of geography if you're interviewing with an alum or if you're on campus. But again, we won't put that information in your file. We don't even see it if you've interviewed. Um, if you're applying, we don't, we don't even necessarily know that information. So not a huge part of our side of the process, but can be a great way for students to um, kind of learn more about the college if they're able to get here. Got it. Great. Okay. Um, does anyone else have a question? I don't mean to take over. If anyone else has something they'd like to speak up and ask right now. Okay. Well, I'll ask a couple more. Um, for early decision and early decision two, is there a better chance of getting in? A lot of people, I feel like it's a very different pool of applicants because who gets their top choice. But do you guys, how many do you normally accept or do you release that information of what percentage is in early? That's a great question. So we, or we receive, I think last year we received about, I want to say 760 early decision applications and we uh, accepted about 380 of them. So definitely, you know, we don't track demonstrated interest, as I said earlier, but really the biggest form of demonstrated interest that you can give a college is to apply early decision. So that's kind of the only place where that enters into our process because we know that you're making this huge commitment to saying Colgate is my top choice. Um, so definitely, you know, that is something that we do take as being a very serious commitment and um, then our overall acceptance rate is about 28 percent so definitely um, you know it is a smaller group it is a smaller pool that we're looking at um, but it is all students who have said that Colgate is their top choice so that's something that is really important to us in that process cool um, and let's see what else what have, when students are applying to Colgate what are kind of your peer institutions that you find a lot of students have a lot of overlap with Great question. Um, so one that immediately jumps to mind is Bucknell. Definitely, they're a similar sized institution. I think they also have a Division One athletics program. Um, what else? Uh, a lot of small liberal uh, liberal arts colleges in rural areas, for sure. Um, some of them are. It's interesting with the geography. Some of them, like Davidson, we have a lot of overlap with as well. Um, I want to say Dartmouth as well. So lots of different um, schools kind of up and down, generally up and down the East Coast um, and mostly small liberal arts institutions. So. Got it. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Excellent. Um, what are the largest size classes students would be in? Maybe freshman year, their core curriculum, how big do they get? Great question. Um, so I think our largest class on record is usually Introduction to Psychology, which is, I want to say, about 100 students or so. Um, and the professor for that class actually learns the names of every single student in that class every year. So definitely, even though you are in this larger lecture hall on our campus, we don't, first off, we don't have any lecture halls on our campus that hold more than, I think, 250 students or so. Um, and none of our classes are that large. I think it's that 100, 150 range um, psychology class is the only huge one. And then you'll have breakout sessions um, that are, you know, run by your professor and by uh, student assistants. Um, although all of our classes are professor taught. So we are 100% professor taught. We don't ever have TAs teaching courses because, again, we don't have graduate students on our campus. So you have maybe that. And I, I don't even know. I think introductory biology might be about 50 students. But those are really the largest classes that we have on our campus. And, again, about 70% are under 20 students. So really lots and lots of small classrooms regardless of what you're, um, what you're studying on our campus. Cool. All right. Um, and the last question I'll ask is just about what, having talked to lots of students who attend Colgate in your job, what are their favorite parts of being a Colgate student? What do you think has drawn them there? That's a great question. I think a lot of what I hear sometimes is just the community in general, because we have students here who see being in this really small community of 2,900 students as this huge opportunity to make an impact and to really try lots of different things and who see living in a small town in upstate New York as an opportunity and not as something that's scary to them. So I think that's, that's the kind of school that that um, that's the kind of student that we're right for is someone who sees that small community as, a, as an opportunity. Um, so I talked to a student who really, and particularly also on in terms of relationships with professors, that's something that I hear all the time um, because students are really able to get to know their professors on like quite and quite a deep level if they'd like to. So one student that I work with um, actually tells this really amazing story about how he had a professor in this one class that 
um, he was a history major, or no, excuse me, he was a um, psychology major, but he was taking this history class kind of just for fun. And he ended up getting really close with the professor because they would walk to the dining hall at the same time every day after, after class for lunch. So then they started eating lunch together. And then he decided to actually go abroad on her study abroad program, even though it was a history program, had nothing to do with what he wanted to study. Um, but he got really close with her there. And then I think he ended up doing research with her. So he ended up making this whole relationship with this, with this professor basically just kind of by accident. And it's not even someone who's in his major department, um, but he has this you know person who could write him a recommendation, this person who's taught him all of these additional skills. And then he said all this history research that he did, he came back and is actually applying to his um, senior thesis in psychology. And he's kind of cross, um, He's sort of crossing those methods there and using things that he's learned in these different disciplines. So that's something that I've heard a lot. I had another student that I talked to um, who said that his professor lives in Albany, which is about two hours away from here. Um, and they actually came and commuted in over the summer when he was living here and working in the Office of Admission. She actually came in and met with him at a coffee shop for a few hours just because, you know, they wanted to see him and um, talk to him because he was doing research with them in the fall and get him get the ball rolling on his research. So definitely that faculty dedication, community mindset. Those are two, the two things that really stand out to me when I hear from our students. Cool. All yeah. right. Um, do we have any other questions from anyone else? All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, good luck with the snow that is probably <laughs> on its way or already there. And we really appreciate you taking some time to tell us more about Colgate. Great. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Have a great evening. Thanks. You too.